Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I really hope that we can we can see each other uh, physically again very soon. So, but for the moment, this is a very nice opportunity to see you again. I'm very happy to to see many of you uh, uh, and to meet you uh, even by by video. <laughs> so. Um, so, well, as the title says, I, I will I will speak about automorphisms of uh, hypersurface of, of smooth hypersurfaces, and this is a joint work with Victor Gonzalez Aguilera and Alvaro Liendo. Uh, actually, as I we just spoke, at, I am currently as oh, I have to share again. Oh, uh, let me. Everything just, is is working well, I think. Yeah. I, I just uh, okay. No, no. <laughs> No, it's perfect. It's just okay. Actually, I'm, uh, right now I I am in uh, Alvaro's house. Actually, <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, automorphism. So, let me give you a, a brief, uh, how to say, um, summary of the talk. I will first give more or less a motivation. Uh, then I will speak about more recent results. This this first part will be more uh, a panoramic, uh, I, would, I would say, view of the of the topic. Uh, of course, there are many things that I will left out. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about this uh, this new results with uh, Victor and Alvaro. And maybe at the end I will I will give you uh, some I don't know questions that arise uh, from this work. <laughs> Hopefully you you will be interested in some of these uh, questions. Um, so okay. So first of all, why automorphisms? Before even before starting. Uh, I think they are very interesting for many reasons, as you may know. I, I mean, varieties with automorphisms tend to be kind of very special or very symmetric. Uh, they tend to be in a, also in a very special uh, locus of the modulus spaces, uh, the, the singular locus, for instance. And uh, typically, if you can understand these uh, these uh, varieties with automorphism maybe you can say some stuff about the the singular locus of your of, that you are trying to understand for instance of your model space like i don't know for curves or or abelian varieties you can try to use them to to say that this locus is i don't know connected or some stuff like that uh this is one reason i think uh, another reason maybe i think in, that it's kind of important is um, is uh, because of the this famous block conjecture. Uh, there's a very nice uh, the, this block conjecture is related with the zero cycles of uh, of uh, degree zero, and you're you're trying to understand this in I don't know surfaces of a uh, uh, general type of uh, PG was equals zero. Is that Kind of very very interesting and difficult problem. And one uh, nice approach by Inose and Mizukami uh, actually uses the that the if you have uh, some surfaces with extra automorphisms, then you can you can actually try to prove this this conjecture. Uh, this actually was the case for uh, uh, for the classical Godot surface, right? This Fermat quotiented by this uh, set uh, this group of uh, order five. And you can you can use this kind of stuff. So yeah, this was just a kind of a general motivation. So I just wanted to say that uh, it's very interesting in general to to have varieties with automorphisms. I, I think the the first case to look at are hypersurfaces, since are very nice and very I don't know kind of simple and somehow somehow, but they're still very interesting to to same stuff uh, say stuff about about them. So <laughs> these are more or less a motivation. <laughs> And let me give you some. Let me fix some notation now. Um, so for us, we will fix a, a f a polynomial, right? Homogeneous polynomial, non-zero of degree d, and we will look at hypersurface. So x will be the zero locus of this f in a projective space of dimension n plus one. Uh, I just want that in order to the 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 hypersurface to have dimension n, right? <laughs> uh, we'll suppose that n is bigger than one, even uh, I mean, everything is, will be also okay for curves if you are interested in algebraic curves, in plain algebraic curves. So, uh, but if you are interested in higher dimensional hypersurface, this is still okay. Um, the degree, of course, is uh, the degree of the polynomial, um, and I will suppose that the degree is at least three, uh, since otherwise, I don't know, if degree is one, you can use linear algebra, and degree two, you have quadrics. 
that can, can be also understand understood by by means of linear algebra you know the, by linear forms etc so i will suppose that the degree is at least three and pretty much uh, the whole talk maybe at the end i will say some words about the singular case but everything will be smooth uh, in the whole, during the most of the talk so the smooth hypersurfaces of dimension n and degree d so let me give you some, of course, examples that you probably know already, but they will they will appear later. So so I will I will introduce them anyway. So of course, very nice examples of uh, of hypersurfaces are elliptic curves, the plane curves of degree three, uh, the predictive plane rails and stuff like this. And uh, we have a very nice. I mean, you can use the Jacobian criterion to say if uh, this is a smooth or not, and you have a discriminant that uh, that tells you that I mean, if this this uh, quantity is non-zero, then it's smooth, and then you call this this curve an elliptic curve. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, this will appear la later. Um, another nice example that also will be important later is our uh, quartic K3 surfaces. So um, a very short way to to define them is a. Uh, they are a smooth surface of degree four on P3. And as you may know, they, by, I don't know, left, left shed cyberplane section, uh, they have to be um, simply connected. And by adjunction, you have that the canonical divisor is, is trivial, so they are K3, K3 surfaces. Um, so, well, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty much it. But let me, let me recall you a classical way to, to construct these uh, surfaces uh, from, a, uh, from linear algebra. And this is the following. So this will be, I mean, a very particular, very particular kind of, uh, of a degree four hypersurf, uh, degree four K3 surfaces that will appear later on. So let me recall this. Um, it's a nice example. So consider uh, four bilinear equations uh, like this. So we are in, a, in this product, P3 times P3. Uh, we will very soon assume that the, the coefficients are general. So we have, a, this is a dimension five. And if you take uh, four of them, you, you obtain a, a surface. And um, so the, the question is, what is the projection of this surface onto the, the each of these uh, factors? And uh, you can see that, uh, I mean, this is pretty much linear algebra. That you can see that the, a point on the on this first factor uh, belongs to the image, if and only if uh, well, you have to satisfy the equation, right? <laughs> so you have a matrix uh, times y equals zero. And uh, you have to, you need a non-trivial solution, right? Because you are in the predictive space. And this is uh, translated in, in the, into the fact that the determinant of this matrix has to be zero. And what is this matrix? It's uh, a matrix uh, obtained by linear forms uh, like this. You fix one variable, right? Uh, and um, so the projection on the, on, onto the fixed first factor is, uh, is given by this determinant of the equation, uh, this S1 degree four surface. And of course, you can do this, this exactly the same thing with the, the, another, the other projection uh, with P2. And you, give a, you have a, another surface, also degree four. And um, it is very interesting because you can check that if the coefficients are general, then uh, first of all, the surface the, uh, on, this predictive, on this product is actually smooth. And moreover, uh, the projections are actually isomorphisms. So you have two models of the same abstract, abstract surface, uh, S, S1 and S2. And both are, the, are isomorphic as well. So this will appear later, as I, I told you. Uh, of course, these surfaces are very, very special. Not every K3 surface is like this. Uh, these are like a determinantal uh, hypersurfaces. Uh, so it's rather restricted, right? Uh, Actually, the fact that uh, uh, this uh, quartic uh, K3 surface can be can be written as a determinant of a matrix with linear forms is is pretty much related with the existence of a so-called uh, Ulrich bundles, right? Actually, Ulrich line bundles, and we know that this they they're not exist exist in general uh, uh, of rank one. Uh, 
well, anyway, I won't, I won't speak about that, but just to tell you that these are rather restrictive class of K3 surface, but it's still pretty interesting interesting for the for our purposes of uh, understanding automorphisms. I will, I will tell you a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, so keep in mind this example. <laughs> uh, Another two very two classical examples are Fermat hypersurface. So this is related with the, you know the Fermat theorem if you want, but the, this is the most maybe the most symmetric hypersurface uh, is given by this equation. And you can check by hand that this is smooth. <laughs> this is a very easy ex exercise on the Jacobian criterion, right? Um, and another nice and very classical example is the Klein hypersurface. So it's very, very symmetric as well, but a little bit less. So this is, uh, you, you pick a variable, x0 to the power d minus 1, then the next variable, and so on. And actually, this is smooth because of d is, uh, is uh, at least 3. <laughs> it's a very nice exercise, I would say, to, to look at the case of d equals 2, uh, because it's, it is not always uh, smooth in that case. Maybe it's, a, it's an exercise of Nilian algebra, this uh, Gauss algorithm to factorize uh, quadratic forms. <laughs> and you can convince yourself that the rank of this quadratic form is not always a, a, a maximum rank. And so, <laughs> But the, if the degree is at least three, you, you, you have a smooth hypersurface. Uh, it's a tricky exercise on Jacobian criteria, but it's still, it's still smooth. Okay, so these are the main examples for the, for today. And um, uh, so one one question is, if you have two hypersurfaces on uh, the same projective space, uh, when these hypersurfaces are are isomorphic, first of all, as as abstract uh, varieties, and and secondly, as embedded varieties, say if they are isomorphic by means of a automorphism of the ambient space. Okay, so this is one of uh, one natural question, and um, well, the first case to look at is uh, when the, the both are the same or they are equal to x, and in that case, we sh we should look at the automorphism group of the, of x to try to understand this question. So this is the, the automorphism group. So there are the isomorphism of, of x as an abstract variety, and this uh, automorphism, of course, I mean regular automorphism. Um, so let me give you some well-known examples. So first of all, I think one of the uh, first maybe applications uh, uh, in a course of uh, algebraic geometry when you start, start to study the Picard group, right? You prove that the automorphism group of uh, Pn is actually uh, given by the matrices, right? Of course, you have to projectivize, you have to quotient by the center of this group. Uh, but otherwise, there are not other isomorphisms, automorphisms, sorry. So the automorphism group of the projective space is very well known, is PGL. And, uh, and uh, of course, if you have a hypersurface in the projective space, you can, you can ask yourself, what are the automorphisms of the hypersurf uh, hypersurface that, came that comes from the, for the ambient space? Uh, these are precisely the, the linear automorphisms. So this is the linear part of the automorphism group. Okay, so I don't know, for instance, uh, if you take the Fermat hypersurface, of course, every permutation matrix leaves this equation invariant, so these are linear automorphisms. So this is a nice example. On the, how to say, on the other side, uh, it is not true that all, all automorphisms have to be linear. So the very first nice example, I think, and that's why I just introduced this before, are elliptic curves. So if you have a, an elliptic curve like this, um, you can define a, a, an automorphism, yeah, actually in evolution, in a very nice way uh, by the following uh, geometric co construction. You pick a point x, uh, first of all, you fix a point p0. Uh, I think I changed my notation. <laughs> Here I took Q here and the drawing, sorry. <laughs> so you fix Q uh, and you, you define this involution by drawing this line uh, connecting X and Q. And you look at the third intersection point and this will be the image. Uh, this is an automorphism, uh, it's very regular, um, but typically it's not, not, not linear. Um, actually, you can prove that this, this automorphism is linear 
if and only if uh, the point that you are taking is an inflection point of your elliptic curve, right? So for, for just give, let me give you an example. If you take, for instance, uh, the, the point at the infinity here, uh, this is an inflection point, and if you pick some coordinates so for, for x, I don't know, let's say a, b, and you do this this thing using this point, then you have the, actually the, the, the reflection a minus b, minus b. So this is pretty linear, right? <laughs> and this is the case for every for every inflection point of the elliptic curve. But the point is that there are only finally many of them, actually nine. So most of the automorphisms of in, uh, that arise in this way are not linear. So this inclusion is strict in that case. Another example, and that's why I just told you <laughs> before about uh, uh, is the it is, it is the example that I just told you before. Uh, Quartic K3 surfaces. Uh, so with the same notation as before, we have a, a abstract surface S that I constructed in this product of P3 times P3. And by means of this linear algebra stuff, we, you, you can see this surface as a determinant uh, surface in, in P3, that B. And also by another, uh, there are two ways to see this as a, as a determinant, right? If you fix the variable of x, or if you fix the variable of y, and actually it's a very nice computation from linear algebra that I'm not sure, but maybe this goes back even to Cayley, that if you that if you um, you do the Kramer rule, I mean you have the the, the a determinant, right? So you can uh, compute it using columns or rows, etc. Actually, if you do that, you can produce an, an isomorphism from the surface S1 to the surface S2. That is given by three by three minors. Uh, so this is uh, actually of degree three. Uh, it's not linear. And using that, you can cook up. Actually, uh, you can you can convince yourself. I, I won't do it, but uh, you can you can convince yourself that the linear automorphism, linear automorphisms are strictly contained in the automorphism group of this kind of uh, K three surfaces. Um, and also, I should mention that the um, how to say it. The fact that there are non-linear automorphisms uh, on a K3 surface uh, actually was known by by Segre. It's a very classical thing around uh, 44, if I remember correctly. So, so, so not not every hypersurface uh, has a linear automorphism. I mean, the automorphism group may be non-linear uh, as well. But there is a classical and uh, very nice theorem by Matsumura Monsky that that tells you that uh, these are essentially the only exceptions. So if you have a, a smooth hypersurface uh, of dimension n at this one, so even for curves uh, works okay, and degree at least three, then first of all uh, the linear group, the linear part of the automorphism group, the, this linear automorphism is a finite group. And here I should mention that this fact, this this first item, was already known by Jordan in uh, in this year. It was a very classical result. Of course, Jordan proved it by uh, by hand. <laughs> he but he actually already knew that the, if the hypersurface was smooth, then this group has to be uh, finite. Of course, they they recovered the same result by in a more, much more geometric way. But it's a very nice uh, result of Jordan as well. Um, another thing is that if the hypersurface is general in the in its model space, so if you have if you have a general coefficients, then the automorphism group is trivial. So as I told you at the very beginning, the the fact of having uh, automorphisms makes your hypersurface uh, rather special. And the last part uh, to close this picture is that uh, if you are not an elliptic curve nor a quartic K3 surface. Then every automorphism is linear, so this is a very nice uh, result, I think. Um, and actually, we have an even better result, uh, which is a combination of uh, some classical results. Uh, classical, I mean, uh, some uh, results by Netter, Lefschetz, uh, the big Matsusaka theorem, another result by Manford, uh, uh, etc. Very, very uh, important and classical result. Uh, together with very recent ones, actually, by Keiji Ogiso uh, and Shimada Shioda, uh, we have that um, if you have two uh, hypersurfaces in the 
in the projected space uh, of the same dimension and maybe different degrees. Uh, if they're isomorphic as, as abstract varieties, actually they have to be isomorphic as embedded varieties. Uh, I mean, in other words, there is a, um, a an element of PGL that sends one to another. I mean, the, this isomorphism actually is the restriction of some linear stuff. This is very interesting and very restrictive, but very nice. Uh, except maybe as well in the case of elliptic curves and quartic K3 surfaces. So, so um, I would say that the, this this last part was uh, was uh, was done by Ogiso and Shimada Shio. By by means actually of, the, of this last example of uh, uh, that I just told you, this determinant uh, stuff. Okay, so this is the more or less the the classical picture. Uh, now I will uh, I would like to tell you some recent results um, about this hypersurface uh, automorphisms of uh, of hypersurfaces. So let me fix some again some some notation. So if you have uh, you fix your dimension and your degree, uh, you have a, a parameter space of uh, all possible hypersurface of degree d and dimension uh, of dimension n, right? This is this. Linear, linear series, linear space, right? Uh, this pre-exception, pre-activization of this uh, H zero, and this is as well a, a projective space, as you may know, <laughs> of this dimension. You can compute it, and uh, the point that if you inside of this, if you look at the um, at the locus of smooth hypersurfaces, so this will be an an open uh, Sarisky opens uh, an open Sarisky set in, here inside. And uh, and the, actually the the complement is a divisor. Uh, this is a very classical as well. Uh, you can prove this by I don't know by some Bertini stuff. Uh, and this is a, the, a very how to say a high dimensional uh, generalization of that that you have this discriminant for elliptic curves and if it's zero or not it tells you whether your your curve is smooth or not. So you have this in high dimension as well. And um, in order to, to look at finite groups, because this will be the one, one of the main topics of, of the talk, we will restrict ourselves. We will restrict ourselves to the to the to the nice cases. I mean, we won't uh, look at the elliptic curves nor to k uh, k3 surfaces. So let's assume that for let's assume that for the rest of the talk. And uh, as I just told you, in that case, uh, a smooth hypersurface. So in this open set. Will have finite automorphism group, which will be linear as well. So this will be the, the our setting, and and uh, we can say a little bit more. Um, it's a, uh, an, there's a nice result of, of differential geometry, right? This Erisman um, vibration theorem that uh, to, tells you that if you have a, a Hypersurface of the same degree on same dimension, actually they are all diffeomorphic, and uh, in particular they are all homeomorphic, and uh, the middle cohomology group uh, are all uh, are all the same and are constant. And actually you can compute this Betty number. This is very explicit in terms of the degree and the dimension is here. And essentially you have a lattice, and you have a, that the automorphism group acts on this lattice. And uh, an important thing is that the action is actually f uh, faithful. Uh, you can prove this by means of deformation theory if you want. And uh, once you have a faithful action on a, on a lattice, then you can invoke some very classical results by Minkowski on lattices that tells you that if you have a, if you fix the size of the lattice, uh, the, the rank, and uh, you look at, uh, there are only finally many uh, finite groups acting there. So. This tells you that if you fix the the dimension and degree, there are only finally many uh, groups that can arise. Actually, there is a universal bound from the for the automorphism for the order of the automorphism groups of hypersurface of the of dimension n and degree d. So this is the the main question: <laughs> how to bound this? I mean, uh, first of all, find this this constant that will be nice. There there. Are, there are results in that direction, um, but of course, the the even more precise, we can ask uh, what are all the possible admissible groups uh, in dimension n and degree d. In other words, for which groups there is a hypersurface 
such that uh, G is a subgroup of the automorphism group of this hypersurface. So this is the main kind of the main question. And uh, in order to try to give you some some idea what what is known, let me give you a small hierarchy of uh, finite groups. <laughs> you may learn on a I don't know a course of uh, <laughs> group theory. So what what does it mean this uh, this diagram? Uh, so first of all, of course, you have the trivial group. You know that uh, for general hypersurface, uh, the automorphism group is trivial, so this appears. <laughs> But then you can you can start to th uh, think about uh, what cyclic groups appear, right? So this, uh, what I mean here is that uh, with these arrows is that this group is an example from this uh, is cyclic, but it's not trivial. Of course, you can also think about abelian groups, and so this arrow means that uh, <laughs> every cyclic group is abelian, <laughs> and this group here uh, is abelian but not cyclic, and so on. So of course there are many kinds of deep, of abelian groups, right? And the maybe the most uh, I don't know uh, com uh, complicated ones are simple groups, or sol solvable, and of course we have all finite groups. So in this hierarchy, one one would like to to start to say th something. Uh, for instance, what kind of cyclic groups appears? What kind of abelian groups appear? And so on. So let let me give some 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 results and uh, that direction. So maybe um, one of the first uh, uh, definite, uh, how to say, final answers in, in, in to this question, uh, to the main question, is a, is a work by Dolgashev and Skovsky. Um, they will look at the Cremona group, right? Uh, final groups inside the, the Cremona group. Uh, and in, on the way, they studied the automor finite automorphism groups of uh, smooth cubic uh, surfaces, and actually they 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 classify all possible uh, all possible G, and there are only eleven non-isomorphic maximal uh, subgroups of uh, groups of maximal order. So every every other subgroup will be a every other group that appears will be a subgroup of these eleven uh, eleven groups. So this is a, a kind of a very satisfactory answer. This is the kind of the answer we, we expect. But of course, to have a, such a precise answer, usually you have to fix the dimension and the degree. This is kind of the the <laughs> yeah the, the picture. Uh, one one of the I, I would say the one of uh, first uh, general um, result in any dimension and any degree, uh, but with some restrictions is the work of Victor with Alvaro, uh, the series of works. And they, they prove that if you have a, a, a power of a prime number and you assume, uh, this is actually an assumption at this point, that this this prime, uh, this not prime, this power of prime is uh, relatively prime to the degree and to the degree minus one, then you actually have a very nice criterion that tells you which cyclic groups uh, of this order, of power of a prime, can appear. This is a, a very effective. So not every uh, cyclic group can appear. This is a first <laughs> consequence of this. Uh, so this group will be admissible in dimension n and degree d, if and only if you can you can find an, an integer from one to n plus two, the number of variables, such that this equation holds. Uh, mod Q. So this is a very nice criterion. You can you can play around with this actually, and you can you can say a lot of things uh, using this. Um, another nice result uh, that that I should mention is a result by Pambianco and Harui. Uh, this is, is quite recent if you think about because it's a it treats about a algebraic curves, plain algebraic curves, which are of course very classical objects. But uh, it, it is very recent. Uh, uh, these are very recent results about the, the automorphism groups. So what is the result? Uh, they prove that uh, first of all they give you a, a this uh, this bound that we we wanted before this universal bound. So the automorphism group of a plane curve has a, a order at most six uh, d square, and they characterize the quality cases. So the quality case is actually uh, um, given by the Fermat uh, curve. So this is a most symmetric curve uh, with two exceptions. The first exception is uh, very classical as well, the degree four, 
is the Klein uh, quartic that you may know as well. And in this case, the automorphism group is PSL2F7. Uh, another very classical and very nice uh, exception is the Wieman sextic, which is in this equation, given this, by this equation. And uh, in that case, the automorphism group is A6. But besides these two examples, uh, the Fermat, the Fermat hypersurface is the most symmetric one. And actually, we kind of hope that this is the 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 picture in general. Uh, so far. In all the examples that we know, uh, this is the case. The Fermat hypersurface is actually the most symmetric in, in the sense that the, it the, has the largest automorphism group, but it's not well known actually, it's not known if this is the case uh, in general. This is, a, I think this is a very nice question. This is the candidate for a, for the, this universal bound would be Fermat, but we don't know how to prove it yet. <laughs> um, so another nice example is a uh, another nice result. Sorry, is a result a recent result by the Ogiso and you. Uh, they look at the quintic trifolds, so they are Calabi-Yau trifolds. Uh, that's why they are they were looking at, at them, and they proved that the well more or less a very very nice answer. They 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 solved this main main question in that case. In other words, they they determine all admissible uh, groups G. For this quintic trifle, and there are actually 22 uh, non-isomorphic of maximal order. And um, for cubic trifles, uh, also we know the the full answer. This is a very recent result, uh, together with a classical result by Adler. Uh, in this case, we have that uh, there are only six possibilities. So this is a uh, uh, this is more or less all I think. More or less uh, all that we know in the in the sense that we have a full classification. There are partial results as well for uh, surfaces of degree four. There are very nice uh, works by Radulasa and Chi Wei Cheng in the case of uh, cubic fourfolds, uh, but not all the groups. Uh, but yeah, so there's still a lot of work to do uh, in some interesting particular cases, I think. And uh, again. Uh, in regard of, the, of this uh, hierarchy of finite groups, uh, we have now a, a first a definitive answer for this part. <laughs> so the first step is, is done now, uh, thanks to the uh, very recent work of Chi Wei Cheng. Uh, he's in Bonn now, and uh, he, deter he, he gives a precise criterion to determine all possible cyclic groups that are miscible in dimension n and degree d. We now now have something. <laughs> so I, I will tell you a little bit more about this actually in a few minutes. Uh, so now I can tell you about uh, our results. So so how to prove this kind of results? Uh, so there are essentially two more or less two approaches. Uh, the first approach is the the approach that that was used by Dolgachev and Skovsky. Uh, essentially, they, they they study this action on this lattice that I just told you before. Uh, there is a phase of action from the out, uh, of the automorphism group on this uh, H2, uh, but this has a uh, you have a lot of geometry here, right? You have an intersection form. You can you can say a lot of, a lot of things, and using this you can actually classify these groups. Uh, this is also I should say the well uh, a more complicated version of this is the is the way that uh, Radulasa and Jiwei Cheng uh, study cubic fourfolds, because you have also a very nice lattice and so on, and you can also play around. Uh, so this is one of the approaches. And another approach, um, ah, well, for for curves that you you can you can for curves you can you can use another approach that I didn't wrote. Is that since you're on a on a, uh, on a with a since you're looking at with a to a plane curve, your automorphism group will be a subgroup of PGL3. And the PGL3 is not that big, and you can you can do things by hand, more or less. I mean, you can you there is a classification of the finite subgroups of PGL3, and you can try to do it by hand. It, of course, it's a very I mean, have to look uh, work a lot, but you can, I mean, they they did it. Uh, but for PGL4 and so on, although there are some some Classification results of finite groups, they 
the the lists are huge. I mean, I think they, we, sh we should use a more uh, geometric approach. And uh, this is what the uh, Ogiso Wei and you did. Um, so what they did is actually try to use representation theory. Um, and this was actually our starting point, uh, our motivation for, for working on this. Uh, they, if, if, if you have a subgroup of your, your hypersurface, uh, which in that case was a trifold, yeah, cubic trifold, quintic trifold, uh, they, they separate the, the analysis in essentially in two cases. And one of these cases was uh, in the case where, where your group admits uh, a lifting to GL5. So I will explain you right now what, what, what I mean by lifting. But essentially, it's a group that is the same. And once you have the uh, actual lifting, you can use all the tools from representation theory. You can, if you, are, if you, you manage to bound the, the order of the gr this group, even if it's a, a rough bound, you can still try to play around with the classification of finite groups uh, by computer, say, and try to to look at the faithful representations and and try to say something. And this works actually, and this is the way that they they prove this their results. So this was our main motivation to to give a criterion for liftability in order to to ensure that you can do all these uh, things, you can use representation theory and try to play around and try to give classification results in that, with, with that kind of tool. So uh, what is liftability for us? Um, so if you have a hypersurface X, yeah, you're given by your equation F, you fix the, fix the equation. Uh, of course, there, there's some ambiguity, right? You, you can multiply by non-zero constant, but you fix your equation. F, uh, and you look at the at the group G, uh, subgroup G of the automorphism group of your hypersurface, and you say that a subgroup uh, G twiddle of uh, GL n plus two is a lifting of the, your group. If two things happen, first of all, uh, when you restrict the canonical projection from GL to PGL, it's an isomorphism, so the group is, is the same. <laughs> and uh, but moreover, every element fix your equation. So there is a natural, natural action right on uh, on I don't know the symmetric algebra if you want of the of, of your vector space of, uh, you can you have an induced uh, uh, representation if you want and you can you can you can ask whether or not this G fixes this F you you know that the, since it is an automorphism uh, it fixes uh, up to a non-zero constant right but we ask here that actually fix the equation. So it has to be uh, F, not lambda F. So let me give you some examples of this this, th this thing. Um, so the first example is the Fermat hypersurface. Uh, here we know uh, it's a very classical result that the, the automorphism group of this thing is uh, uh, the semi-direct product. Uh, so you have essentially you have permutation matrices. Of course, they are liftable, and you have a um, uh, you can rise to. I mean, you can how to say this. This part is essentially multiplied a variable x i to uh, some uh, root of the unity, death root of the unity, right? X i, and of course, if you are replacing the equation, <laughs> it's still invariant, right? Here you have this. Uh, so, and all of these are liftable. Uh, so you have that the automorphism group of the Fermat is always liftable. Uh, but for another classical example, the Klein hypersurface, uh, you have to be more careful. Careful, uh, it's not always the case. So, and this actually motivated our our uh, our analysis that I will tell you in a minute. Uh, <laughs> So the first, uh, the first thing that you can you can see is that if you assume that the degree and the and the number of variables n plus two are not uh, relatively prime, so you have a common factor, uh, then you you can pick a prime number that divides both uh, d and the number of variables, and you can cook up this uh, this uh, automorphism. This lives in in GL, G twiddle. And uh, 
And you can check, first of all, that uh, is well defined. Essentially, you, you have uh, some packages of variables, right? Uh, uh, this, this number of packages. And uh, you, you can just replace here. And, uh, and this induces an automorphism uh, because of these disability conditions. But actually, you can see that uh, this is not invariant. And I didn't tell you before, but this condition of this stability is invariant by change of coordinates. So if you have some coordinates in which uh, your automorphism is not uh, liftable, then it is never liftable. So you have to just have to check it in these coordinates, and and you you can see that the automorphism group of this uh, clean hypersurface is not liftable if the the degree and the number of variables are are not uh, relatively prime and our result is that uh, this is actually the only the only restriction um, if you have a hypersurface a smooth hypersurface which is not a elliptic curve nor a k3 surface then the whole automorphism group is liftable if and only if uh, these numbers are relatively prime so this in this way you can lift everything to gl gl n plus two and try to do some representation theory. And I think that with this may, may be helpful to to classify maybe another uh, possible groups in, in maybe in some interesting hypersurface. So this is the, the main theorem. Um, <laughs> well, that's it. And, uh, and in, in order to, to prove this, 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 uh, this result, we actually needed a, a a small generalization of a previous result by Victor and Alvaro, uh, which is the following. Um, if you have, a, again, a power of a prime number, uh, then this Q is the order of some liftable automorphism. Here we, here we have to assume the liftability assumption of some hypersurface of degree D and dimension N. Uh, this holds if and only if you have uh, uh, these three conditions. So we have, there are three cases. The first case is where the this prime number does not divide d nor the d minus one, and this was already treated by the work I just told you before. So the the new cases are these two. Uh, we have also very similar conditions uh, in the case where the prime divides the degree and the prime div divides the degree minus one. And as you may see, they, they are very very easy to check. <laughs> Uh, they're pretty much uh, the same kind of uh, equations uh, mod Q. And e this is case is even easier. You have just to factorize and then it's okay. <laughs> yes. uh, so I should mention that, uh, well, this is going, uh, as I will tell you in a few minutes, this was part of the proof of this theorem, theorem A, was well, kind of a tool to get through to this theorem. And uh, this uh, was generalized as well by Ji Wei Cheng. Uh, actually, Chi Wei was uh, looking to um, uh, abelian groups uh, on hypersurfaces, uh, not necessarily cyclic. And uh, along the way, he he studied the the cyclic case, and actually he gave a more general criterion. He, as I just told you, maybe here, um, he gave actually the full answer for the for every cyclic group. So this is, but unfortunately, I mean, they, I mean, this is very nice result, but it's not that easy to, not that compact to state. So I won't uh, state. Uh, so the, let's say that in the, the case of a uh, power of a prime number is, is, is a very compact compact uh, criterion. <laughs> okay, so this is the main result. Um, we have a liftability criterion uh, for every hypersurface, with, which is not a, an elliptic curve, not a K3 surface. So let me give you some examples uh, how to use this. Uh, so of course, cubic hypersurfaces are very nice. We all love them. Uh, so this is a, a nice case to to, to start with. Um, so the the you can use this criterion that I just give you in theorem sorry uh, B to look at the um, admiss um, admissible uh, cyclic group groups of this form, which are least liftable. And in this case, you can bound, uh, you can give a, a very explicit bounds. I mean, for instance, I don't know. Uh, if typically, if your prime is not two or three, 
then you have very few possibilities. You have 5, 5, 11, 5, 7, 5, 7, 11, 43. Right. So this is very restrictive. Uh, I want to. This is what I want to tell you. Not every cyclic group appears. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So this is a nice example. But the problem is that actually, of course, if you know the order of an automorphism, uh, you can have a. For instance, uh, let's say you have a one automorphism of order two. You can have many of them, and you can have a direct sum of them. So the 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 order of this group uh, grows a lot, can can grow uh, can be, be can be very big. So a natural question is, can we get some uh, bounds on the order of the automorphism group of X, right? Using this kind of stuff, and we can do it in some cases. So let me recall you. This is a very classical for a group theory curse, right? <laughs> you have a what is a silo piece of group are the groups of, of order P to the R, and this R is maximal, right? Just a reminder <laughs> uh, of group theory. Um, so we, we are we're able to, to, to bound this, uh, the order of this P uh, silo uh, in some cases. Uh, so if you have a prime number, uh, which does not divide the degree uh, D minus one, and you define this L to the PR, to be the minimum integer uh, such that this equation holds. This actually was the, the question that appeared here, right? This equation tells you if, you, if your prime is admissible or not. Um, then you have that uh, uh, if your hypersurface has degree at least three, uh, the GCD of, of the degree and the number of variables is one, and you, the, your prime satisfy this this previous condition, right? Uh, this is an assumption. Then, if this number is large enough, uh, in a precise way, uh, L p square is larger than n plus two, and two L p is larger than n plus two, then you can say that p s p s square does not divide the order of the automorphism group. In a more precisely, this tells you that if you have a p zero subgroup, then this is trivial. Right, this is always possible, or cyclic of order p. So you, it's very very small p zero subgroup. So this uh, I think is a well, I, I think it's a nice application. And first, you may think that this is kind of restrictive, but actually for, uh, for a small degree for cubic surface, a uh, hypersurface, for example, it's not that restrictive. You can prove, for instance, that if you have a I don't know, let me tell, tell you something, uh, a cubic trifold. Then the order of the automorphism group, uh, the part which is not uh, uh, divisible, I mean, this is the P, right? P equals 3 doesn't work very well because it's the degree of the hypersurface. P equals 2 is D minus 1, so we cannot control this part. But the other part, we can actually give a, a uniform bound. Uh, also for I don't know cubic five folds we can we can say this that the the maximum power is one actually for a p zero subgroup and if it if you have a p zero subgroup then it has to be cyclic and uh, a thing that we, you you may notice is that <laughs> in the case n equals four cubic four folds you, of course you cannot use this uh, this criterion because uh, you you don't have this condition right. The d equals three, n plus two is six, <laughs> so it's not uh, relatively prime. But still, there is a, a small trick that you can always use: is that if you have a, a cubic fourfold, you can add one variable and cook up uh, a cubic fivefold, and you can embed the uh, the group as a I don't know a bigger group of matrices. You have a like block matrices, and uh, in that way you can you can get a bound using the the next dimension. So dimension five, and in that way you can you can give a uh, this bound as well. So this is uh, still you can say stuff when when the this condition does not uh, hold. Uh, so let me let me give you a very rough idea. The idea in this case for this color corollary is that uh, essentially the if you have a P zero subgroup, so by I don't know group theory, <laughs> if you have a a group of order p to the r, then you have a subgroup of every power p 
to the S where S is less than R, right? This is the content of the silo subgroup, if you remember your group theory course. And uh, so it is, enough to, it is enough to look at the case of P square. And in the case of P square is very nice because by, I don't know, general group theory, there are only two possible groups, is the SIG group and the, this uh, product, right? This is the only two groups of order P square. This first, this first group is impossible essentially by this assumption because it's not admissible. This is, this is more or less direct. And for this, in this case, we, we can do it by hand because of this list liftability assumption. Essentially, we can, we can use actual matrices, not, uh, not how to say, classes in PGL. We're using matrices in GL. And then you can, you can show by hand more or less that there is enough, there's not enough space to have this action because of the size of the matrices. Uh, this is more or less the idea, but uh, so okay. Uh, so in the last, I don't know. I think I have kind of ten minutes, uh, right, Olivia? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You started, started too fast. So okay. So let me give you, I, I think, a, a very rough sketch of the proof. Uh, so I, I think I like the proof because it's kind of very simple, um, but still there are some some well, some issues in the middle. Uh, so if you have your your equation right, uh, and which is not a elliptic curve, no a quartic hypersurf, uh, sorry, quartic K3 surface. Uh, so the first step is that you consider a automorphism here uh, of order Q, and you pick a, a lifting of this uh, single automorphism. This lifting may not preserve the, the equation right, but still it's a lifting uh, of this matrix to GL. And the, I think that the, the key remark is that if, we, if you have a prime which divides the degree of the equation, and you suppose that the order this Q is actually P, uh, if this uh, this um, this automorphism is not liftable, so this phi trill uh, don't preserve the equation, then you have the, that P divides the number of variables. This is kind of the uh, well, I think the key remark, and the idea is that if you have a, well, if that happens, right, uh, I just told you, uh, you can look at the eigenspaces associated with each of these uh, uh, eigenvalues. Um, and uh, this this condition, this, uh, this non-liftability and the smoothness, actually, but I, I won't give a lot of details here, but force that the, the shape of the polynomial of the equation has to be very special. Uh, in some sense, I won't tell you <laughs> very precisely, but this imposes that the that all the the eigen spaces has to has to be of the same dimension. So it is is more or less as the, as, the, as the example as I just told you uh, here, where the eigen value comes in packages of the same size. It's the same picture actually. This is the general picture. Um, so once you have this, of course you have a that the the, tot, the dimension of the total space, which is m plus two, has to be uh, p times any of these dimension because they are all the same. <laughs> so p divides this this guy. And uh, <laughs> well, this is a k observation. Uh, another lemma that we use is that you have a, a automorphism of order q, and you have this uh, this identity. Um, then this is liftable. If and only if the GCD of D and Q divides this number C. So this, and you can put this everything together um, and show that if phi is not liftable, then uh, there exists a, a common, well, as I told you, there, there exists a common factor of uh, uh, here and here. Uh, because of this, because it's not liftable, um, so it's not. Uh, well, um, which is not device uh, C this number, um, right? Because it's not liftable. And then you you can essentially if well you are working with Q, which is a uh, uh, any number, but you can you can factorize this by as uh, P times R, this common factor. And you, the the trick is that you you raise you raise this uh, this automorphism to a power r, and therefore you have an automorphism of order p, 
this is the, the small trick, right? And uh, and you prove that phi is not liftable implies that this this power is not liftable, and you can use this to I mean this key remark to show that the GCD has to be uh, at least uh, two, so they are not uh, relatively prime. This is kind of the the idea. So this is proves one direction. Um, so uh, the second step was to consider phi of order a power of a prime number uh, and liftable. And then we proved this theorem B, as I, that I just told you before. We we analyzed the the possible eigen spaces, and then we we determine which are the admissible ones. And also we can provide explicit examples for the if part. I mean they are actually admissible, not. Uh, the, this is actually a <laughs> if and only if. <laughs> and uh, there, then there's a, a, a third step, uh, which is the following. If you have a automorphism of order of prime uh, power of a prime number, which does not divide these this guys, uh, or does not divide the number of variables, actually we can prove that there is a lifting to SL. Not just to GL, but SL, and this is interesting actually for other reasons. <laughs> uh, for example, I think uh, if you have a cubic fourfold, as you may know, uh, there is a, a natural hyperkähler uh, manifold associated with the, is the Fano variety of lines. This is deformation equivalent to this uh, Hilbert square, right? Of it's a hyperkähler manifold. This is very classical uh, by Boville and Donaghy. Uh, and then actually, every automorphism of your cubic fourfold uh, induces a, a, an automorphism of this hyperkähler. And um, actually, uh, using this 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 SL lifting, uh, we can recover some results that uh, were were proved by Liefu before, uh, in a kind of a uniform way. Uh, we can prove that if the prime is not two or three, because these are kind of the wrong primes. Uh, and you assume that this is symplectic, so it preserves the symplectic uh, form on this uh, hyperkähler uh, fourfold. Then you can prove that the the the, the orders are very uh, very restrictive. They are just five, seven, and eleven by means of this kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, this kind of the uh, application in the mill. <laughs> and uh, and finally, just to finish. Uh, uh, the idea is that you 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 can lift uh, each of these um, pieces of subgroups uh, separately, uh, even to SL in many cases, and uh, and the point is that you want to glue them together to the whole group, and for that you we use this uh, this liftability condition in a, in a strong way. Um, actually, as well in the middle, we we of course we were very much inspired by the work of Ogiso and you. And uh, they used to to do this kind of thing, some some kind of, kind of technical result from group cohomology, it's more concretely this Horschel Serre exact sequence. But actually, with this condition, everything uh, gets much more simpler, and and we can prove it more or less by hand that uh, everything lifts to. I mean, we we get a lifting of the whole automorphism group. And that's pretty much I wanted to say. Let me just maybe. Just tell you one little thing, just one thing here. Uh, so, uh, uh, kind of a work in progress <laughs> with Alvaro and Victor is that uh, we are looking at uh, abelian P groups which are admissible or, or, or abelian groups. This is pretty much complementary to the work of uh, Ji Wei Cheng, uh, as I just told you uh, in the middle. And uh, we believe that is much more easier than the general case of P groups, the, the, the case of abelian P groups. Uh, for instance, just a, an anecdote is that if maybe you have uh, played around with the GAP software, you know that they are the, you have a list of finite groups up to order 2,000. Uh, ex with one ex exception, you don't have the list of all finite groups of degree of order 1,024, and there is a good reason for that is that uh, more or less. There are, I think, uh, 50 million of such groups. <laughs> I mean, 99 more, more than 99% of of all finite groups of order less than 2,000 have precisely this order. 
And there are actually some conjectures on group theory that most of the final groups are are two groups or kind of stuff like that. So, <laughs> so the, the Avelian case is much more treatable. And uh, well, I, I just finished with this phrase that we think that we are not that far actually from the for the general case because of the uh, if in the liftable case because there are this the, there is a pretty well understanding on how far are are abelian groups from for arbitrary finite groups because this is measured by the something which is called the jordan constant uh, which is a very there are a lot of works on this and writing by rational geometry and this measures this this thing so we believe that uh, understanding the case of abelian groups maybe can give us can give us a, a better understanding on of all finite groups so I think I will finish here. <laughs>